So I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Henderson, also from the, the School of Computer Science. Yeah, just going to talk about structured generative models provision. <laughs> Thank you. So we've seen today a bunch of examples, and we know that deep learning in the last 10 years has become really good at doing lots of tasks that previously only humans could do. And this is particularly true in imaging. So for example, if I want to um if I want to change my slide, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. If I want to segment the organs in a CT scan, then I train a segmentation unit and I can get really good results from that. If I want to count penguins in a photograph, then I can train a neural network for penguin density estimation. Or if I want to predict the, the three shapes of neurons in an electron microscopy stack, then again, I train a neural network for that task. So we have all these very um, impressive results, but they all come from supervised learning. In other words, they rely on having a large data set of annotated data. So a human has to go on and manually specify the grand truth. If I want to segment labors, then some unlucky PhD student or whoever has to draw the outline around a thousand labors. So it would be nice if we could get these impressive results, but without the need for all this expensive and time consuming annotation. And that's what unsupervised learning tries to do. So in unsupervised learning, we assume that we still have access to a lot of data, but we don't require that data to have been annotated by a human. Instead, we'll rely on our models, our algorithms, to automatically discover the interesting latent structure in that data, which will allow us to solve our tasks. So one example of one popular, I should say, method um, for unsupervised learning is generative modeling. And by generative modeling, what I mean is learning the distribution of a data set. So given a data set of photographs of cats, say, I want to learn the probability distribution of what they were drawn, and to learn a tractable distribution that I can then draw new samples from, new cats. And the reason that that's useful for unsupervised learning is motivated by this nice quote from uh, Richard Feynman, who said, what I cannot create I do not understand. So in other words, if I have my data set of cats and I train the model to generate cats, then if my model is going to, to succeed at that task, it must learn something about the structure of cats. It must learn what it means for something to be a cat. It must learn that they're furry, they have pointy ears, they have four legs, and so on. Because otherwise, without knowing these things, it wouldn't be able to, to generate new realistic cats. Okay, so the most common approaches to generative modeling are GANs and various autoencoders. And to draw samples from them, we use basically the same generative process for both models. So you first sample a latent embedding variable, say Z usually, from some simple distribution, like a multivariate Gaussian. Then we push that Z through a, a decoder neural network. So the idea is that the vector Z goes in and out comes an image that looks like our training data, looks like it could have come from the same distribution as the training data. For every possible z, we get a plausible looking image. And the model is then trained well, to, to do exactly that, to match the distribution of the generated values x with the empirical distribution of its training data. And exactly how we do that matching depends on the flavor of model of the training, whether it's a game or a GAN or something else. Um, and these generative models can produce very impressive results these days. So these are all examples from the past two years. So at the top left is a VAE, a variational autoencoder generating faces. Bottom left is a denoising diffusion model. So that's yet another type of um, generative model doing various image net classes. At the top right, we have three dimensional CT scans from a GAN. And at the bottom right, we have, again, histopathology images from a GAN. So these are all fake, they're all generated by neural networks. And we can see that the models have captured the, the, the complex structures in these images very well. Of course, they haven't any supervision of these structures, they've just seen a lot of images. 
But still, these generative models don't directly help us realize Feynman's promise of understanding through generation. And that's because their latent embeddings and their decoders are essentially black boxes. And they're not, there's nothing human interpretable in that. So if I know the value of Z corresponding to a given image, that doesn't actually help me know how many objects there are in it, for example, or class those objects are, at least without some further supervised process stage. So what I'm going to look at now is how we can introduce some human interpretable structure into this latent space to create structured generative models. So the idea here is that we'll um, give semantic meanings to, to particular parts of our latent space, to particular latent variables. And we'll do that by forcing the decoder to interpret those latent variables in a particular way. So for example, we know that images typically contain multiple objects. So it makes sense to split our latent space up. So instead of having one Z encoding the entire image, I instead have one Z for each object in the image. Then I can process those somewhat independently. Similarly, we know that the same object can appear at many different locations in an image. And so it makes sense to separate out the latent representation of position from that of appearance. So that leaves us something like the model we have on the slide. And then to complete this, what we do is we decode the appearances with a decoded neural network again. And that's similar to what we did in the whole image case, except we now we do each object independently. And then we have this final stage where it says place and compose, where we stitch together the different objects to create the final image. So this gives us a compositional generative model of images. And it's possible to train this just like a normal DAE almost like a normal DAE, which is to say we add an encoder network, the blue bits on the left here. And that encoder predicts the values of the latent variables that explain a given image. Or more precisely, it parameterizes an approximate posterior distribution on those latent variables. And then with that encoder in place, we can train um, for the, the standard variational bound of the data likelihood, called the elbow, the evidence lower bound, and that has two terms. So the first says that we should be able to reconstruct our input images via this entire model, so via our structured latent space. So we should be able to put an image in, get some z's that explain that image, then decode them and get back the same image at the other end. And the second term is a KL divergence, which basically says that the approximate posteriors from the encoder could match the, yeah, the true prior distribution. Okay, so this is a small modification to the normal GAE training process and a bigger modification to the model itself because we have this structure. The benefit of having done this is that now we can use the encoder that we train here and maybe a small part of the decoder in order to, to process unseen images and get their latent representations. And from those latent representations, we can read out the um, the, the answers, if you like, for different supervised tasks like segmentation and object detection. So if I train a model of basically this structure um, with a few more bells and whistles, but essentially, essentially this is what's happening, and I train it on some um, fairly simple data sets of colored shapes with 2D and 3D, then these are the kind of results we get. So in the left-hand column, I show the images that are input to the model. Then we pass them into the encoder and we decode each of the objects. And the next column shows the instant segmentation predicted by the model. So now we have one color per object. This is showing us the segmentation into different object instances. The next columns, the smaller ones, show the actual individual objects. So now we've encoded our image and we decode each object separately, but we don't recompose them yet into the final image. And we can see that um, it is a nice clear separation of these images into their constituent objects. And in particular, for the, the bottom example here, where you have this very occluded, where I've got a nasty echo, where I've got this highly occluded green triangle, we see that um, the model manages to, to predict the entire extent um, of that triangle. Okay, so this 
this works in a sense. This lets us solve these 2D um, segmentation detection tasks, at least on very simple data. But it's just modeling the, um, the objects, the components of the image, as two dimensional things, as patches of pixels. But in reality, you know that the world around us is three dimensional. We move around in 3D space, we interact with objects in 3D space. And so it'd be nice to also introduce into our latent representation some, rep some representation of this 3D structure of the world. Um, and it turns out this is fairly straightforward to do, at least conceptually, in theory. So currently the model that we have says that we have two positions, X and Y, and also an appearance embedding that gets decoded to pixels. To lift this into 3D, all we need to do is we change these positions to be 3D X, Y, Z vectors, and the appearance we change, well, no, the appearance embedding is still just a Gaussian code, but the, um, the decoder that operates on that now outputs a 3D shape instead of 2D pixels. So maybe it outputs a voxel grid or a texture mesh, some representation of 3D shapes. And then the final operation in this model is no longer just stacking together the pixels of the different objects. Instead, we have to render the 3D scene that's defined by this generative process. Once again, we can train this just by adding an encoder network and training for the usual variational objective, the elbow. So still, we don't need to give any supervision on these latent variables. We don't need to give any supervision on this 3D shape. We're just training the model to auto-encode images via this structured latent representation. The simplest um, sort of concrete instantiation of this model is to assume we just have one object in our image, so the car here, and then that is a 3D thing, and then basically we don't care about the background, we model the background as being some low resolution 2D stuff. And so in that case, we have three latent variables. One Z shape captures the shape of the object, one Z color embeds the, the texture or the color of it, and finally you have a third embedding that um, that is embedding the the contents of this background, which is typically something boring, just a sheet of gray or whatever, or a few road markings. So if we train a model to explain images in terms of this kind of represent latent representation, if I train it on birds, for example, I end up with results that look like this. So in the left-hand column, we have an input image passed to our model. The next column, the second column, shows the result of auto-encoding that image with our model. So we encode the image, we pass it through the latent space, we decode to a 3D shape, and we re-render. And we can see that this reasonably accurately reproduces the birds on the left, but we sometimes use some finer features like lakes. But then because our latent representation is three-dimensional, we can then take that bird and rotate it, and that's what we see in the final images. So I'm taking the same bird that I reconstructed here, just rotating it out of the plane. We well, can see it's predicting a plausible 3D reconstruction of that shape. It's explaining just this simple 2D image. This model, of course, is generative as well, because everything I've about today is generative. And so we can also sample new birds a priori, so new cars. So in this case, we don't give an image as input. We don't have the encoder there, we drop it off, and we just sample the Zs independently from multivariate Gaussian distributions, push them through the decoder. And you can see the model learns of reasonably plausible space of bird textures, bird appearances, and the same for the same for cars. And again, it's doing this without any 3D supervision. It's never seen a 3D bird. It's never had more than one image of the same individual bird. It's just that it's very large data set of um, unannotated images to learn from. Okay, so the final thing we can do here is to extend this to multiple objects. So in the same way as I did in 2D, I said we can, instead of having one B latent Z with the entire image, we have multiple Zs, one per object. We can do that in 3D as well. So now that the world is composed of a 3D scene with several objects placed in a 3D environment, and also a three-dimensional background mesh. And in fact, in this work, we went a step further, and as well as modeling just images, we also model videos. So we allow the camera to move through this 3D world 
generating frames. So if I train this on a data set of fairly simple synthetic videos showing one, two, or three cars driving along a street, so we get results like this. So on the left is the input video, so just a short sequence of about six frames, the camera's moving, the objects are moving. So we pass that into the encoder, and then through the decoder, we get this as the reconstruction. So the second column is showing what we get when we auto-encode those into videos. The third and four columns show the separation of that auto-encoding result into foreground and background parts, the corresponding to the background buildings, roads and things, and also the, the foreground cars. The next two columns give instance segmentation, so we have one color per object. So the, um, the fifth column is the ground truth there, so that's the, the, the ideal output. And then the sixth column is the output predicted by our model. And finally, we have the ground truth and predicted depth maps. So those uh, the bright pixels are the points that are nearer to the camera. And we can see that the model is predicting fairly reasonable segmentations and depth maps, in spite of the fact it didn't have any supervision for either of those tasks. It was just trained to auto-encode videos. OK, I will wrap up there. So in summary, we've seen that structured generative models are uh, generative models that are trained to explain their uh, data distribution in terms of a structured, human interpretable latent space. And by using the encoders of these models, we can then um, solve discriminative tasks like segmentation, detection, and 3D reconstruction without any supervision on those tasks. The final thing I should say is most of the examples here are sort of standard machine learning computer vision data sets. I am very happy to apply this to some scientific data. So if any of you have any interesting data sets that you don't want to annotate, then I'm happy to, um, to look at possible collaboration if you touch. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, yeah. Um, Hi, Paul. Uh, great talk, by the way. Um, I was wondering if there are other, um, there's more information you can get by looking at other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, for example, things such as birds, if you were to look at them with a UV camera, you'd see that there's a lot of atoms on their inner feathers. I was wondering if this is an active part of research in this sort of thing. Hmm. Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, so, in principle, there's nothing magic about the fact that this is producing images. It's just producing what well, they come out of a rendering process, but that's producing um, just pixels with three channels. But in principle, you can characterize the reflectance of the surfaces not just in terms of a simple albedo in RGB space, but in terms of a, a hyperspectral or multispectral thing. So, in principle, yes, I think you could do it. Obviously, in practice, it would depend on how well behaved your data is. But yes, in principle. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering when you have the it actually the latent components going into individual, uh, yeah, individual encoders or decoders, did you then compose get a final thing? Do you, do you just arbitrarily set a maximum number of those that you're running based on the length of your latent vector for a particular problem, or is there a more flexible way of doing it? So unfortunately, yes, we have to upper bound it at least. Um, so considering how many objects should be in the scene as a sort of hard decision problem is not differential, and so it doesn't sit nicely within the VAE training framework. Um, so what we do in practice, so in the last model I talked about with multiple 3D objects, um, I introduced presence indicator variables. So we have a large upper bound on the number of objects, and this is a random scattered initialization of positions. And then each one also has a binary indicator whether it is present in the scene or not. And then we relax that binary indicator to continuous variables so we can differentiate through. But yes, it's a limitation that we have to we have to be able to differentiate through the scene structure in some sense. Thank you. So my question is. When you move to a 3D uh, setting, you allow the backgrounds to have depth values, uh, while when you're operating in a two-dimensional regime, you just keep it a simple, low 
uh, resolution to the uh, sprite essentially. Um, is there a possibility to move towards a, a debt realizing regime in the 2D case? Uh, and also, does it take into consideration the 3D uh, model that you expect? So, in the 2D case, you can sort of extend to an up to two and a half dimensions by predicting depth maps and things. But this gets a bit awkward in practice, and you find yourself basically moving into full 3D. So, for example, if I have, um, how to explain this? So, I have two objects, one like that. I can't do this with my hands holding a microphone. But I have two objects that sort of intersect in 3D space, they have to pass through each other. And so their depth, so that we have to prioritize the depth at every point in every object in order to correctly render a consistent scene. An object might pass through the background, thus. So I need to have the object, depth at every point in every object, and the depth of the background in order to create a truly coherent scene. And by that point, I'm basically modeling 3D point clouds anyway. On the other hand, if I just assign a single depth per object, which is actually what I did for the 2D example there, the background seems to be at the back, then this works, but obviously when you have two objects that sort of that are overlapping along the z-axis and the xy-axis, like for example, they intersect like this in 3D space, then there's no way to define the depths such that you get a, a sensible rendering out. So I would say that yeah, some kind of hybrid between 2D and 3D is a nice plan, but just being purely 2D and adding depth is tricky. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, as I walk back, this not very long we have questions on. Yeah, so you have a various you know, model that's traditional, right? You could have a 2D scene that can be just 3D scene. But you also get the uncertainty in, in the, the outputs of your 3D scenes, like all the possible scenes could be. And it's not actually a traditional model. Oh, okay. It's uh, <laughs> In this case, it's a fully generative model of the scenes and the birds and things. So the image goes into the encoder, but that's the variational encoder. There's no separate encoder for conditioning that would condition it. Um, and so the consequence of that is that the, the, the bits of information in Z, stochasticity in Z, is simply modeling all possible scenes, in a sense. Um, so that's kind of clarification. To more directly answer the question, um, in theory, yes, you get some modeling of the posterior uncertainty because the encoder is outputting a mean but also a variance of the posterior distribution on the sets. Um, in practice, as with many VAEs, this tends to collapse so that the sigmas, the standard deviations, tend to become small and it converges to one, one prediction practice. So mathematically, yes, but in practice, there's very little variance. Okay, thanks again. Um, so, our last speaker, uh, Paul Hampson. I'm just going to wrap up the day with a final talk, uh, our final uh, closing remarks from Oliver. <laughs>